Hey, Eric. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, John. How are you? Good. So many familiar faces. Hi, Gary. Uh, awesome. Eric, Eric is Jim. There you go. <laughs> he switched it. He's set it up for me, my son. We're just going to wait a minute. We're expecting some more people. So. Okay, well, we're about a minute past, so I'm just going to start my introduction here. Sorry if I'm pausing as I'm letting more people in, but um, welcome everybody to the Robert Ferguson Observatory Speaker Series. My name is Stephanie Duramalar. I'm the volunteer coordinator uh, for the observatory, and we're thrilled and honored to have Dr. Thomas Immel presenting for us today, and I'll introduce him in a minute. Um, but before we start, just wanted to remind everyone to please keep yourselves muted to minimize background noise until we open up for questions at the end. Um, it looks like you may not be able to unmute yourself. So if you'd like to ask a question verbally, just um, put a little thing in the chat and I can unmute you. Um, likewise, you're also welcome to post questions in the chat and then I will um, field those to Dr. Immel as we go along at the, at the end of his presentation. Um, so a little bit about the Robert Ferguson, uh, Robert Ferguson Observatory to start with, for those not familiar with us. Uh, we're in, um, run by the Valley of the Moon Observatory Association, which is a 5013C nonprofit comprised of volunteer, amateur and professional astronomers. RFO has fulfilled its mission of offering educational programs about science and astronomy for students, the public and in support of educators for about 25 years now. Uh, the observatory is almost all volunteer run and typically serves about 9,000 visitors annually. Um, the observatory is located in Sugarloaf Ridge State Park and houses a 40 inch reflector telescope, the largest telescope in Northern California that's accessible to the public, a robotic 20 inch research grade CCD telescope and an eight inch two meter long refractor telescope. All that is available for anybody who wants to volunteer to actually learn how to operate. So a little plug for our volunteer program. <laughs> um, we've kept the presentations in our speaker series free to the public uh, for the most part to align with our mission of offering educational based astronomy programs to our community. Um, that being said, if anyone is so inspired to donate to the Robert Ferguson Observatory to ensure that we can continue fulfilling that mission, um, you can do so through our website at rfo.org. Um, so to introduce our, our speaker today, um, Dr. Thomas Immel received his PhD from the Geophysical Institute at the University of Alaska Fairbanks in 1990 followed by postdoctoral physics research at the Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio, uh, in San Antonio, Texas. Today, Dr. Immel serves as principal investigator for, and I'm hope, I hope I'm saying that right, it, do you just say ICON or I-C-O-N? ICON. ICON, thank you, <laughs> at the Space Science Lab at UC Berkeley. In that role, he is ultimately responsible for the scientific success of the mission. He's a research physicist and senior fellow at the uh, space sciences lab at UC Berkeley, where he's worked since the year 2000. He has two boys and has a lot of fun doing computer and music projects with them. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Immel. Thank you, Stephanie. So I'm going to share uh, my slides. And one correction, I graduated, I got my PhD in 98, <laughs> not 1990. That, that would put me a little older than I thought. I don't know where that, that info must be on the web somewhere. No, I don't want to do that. I want to share um, PowerPoint. Come on now. There. Okay. So I'm going to get moving because I know we have a limited amount of time. <clears throat> I'm citing some of my co-authors here, but of course, uh, of course, I can't do any of this without the whole icon and the mighty team, which I'll talk to you about in a minute. <clears throat> 
let's see. So I usually start talks with where's Icon right now? That's where Icon is right now. I thought this was pretty cool. Icon's not always over making observations over California, <clears throat> but in this blue, the blue trace here shows where the satellite has been and is going and the red box shows that it's just south of California, probably in contact with our ground station here at Berkeley, sending us data five times, six times a day, we make contact and pull data down through a number of ground network locations and one of them is Berkeley. So that's great. Data are be taken at the spacecraft and along these green and uh, red orange traces. Um, these are our observations that we're making. When we are flying along around the earth, we're looking off on the edge of the earth on the horizon and making our observations. So I wanna talk about a few things, just introduce the space environment. What are we doing up there? And then talk about the, the interest we have in understanding something we don't know about and we're trying to figure out and talk about our instruments. I think there's some astronomers on this call and um, it would be fun for me to show you some of the things that talk a little bit about the instruments before I get to sort of the final slides on our science. Earth space environment. It starts at about 100 kilometers above the surface. And why is that? Well, in the daytime, you produce plasma at those altitudes. In, in, in fact, below those altitudes, all the way down to about 80 kilometers. But you get a big, it really starts to grow around 100 kilometers where you can get a peak that grows up into the E region. <clears throat> e region. It's just this, this notional names for these regions is noted here in altitude um, where a hundred kilometers I'm showing plasma density or electron density. They're the same thing over on the left-hand side of this plot. Um, lifting surfaces don't work anymore at 62 kilometers to get lift off a wing. You'd have to be going at escape velocity to get lift. So you can't fly a plane up there anymore. So that kind of limits. That's a good uh, one way to think about space. And also diffusion becomes dominant mode of gas transport. Down here, uh, mixing is done by turbulence and uh, uh, temperature gradients that cause turbulence and mixing. That stops up at about 100 kilometers and transfers to a diffusion dominated, <clears throat> which means that as you go up in altitude, there's different amounts of nitrogen and oxygen, which is not the case here. If you go up to Mount Everest, you'd read the same proportions of oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, as you do on the surface, that changes in space. So that has implications that I probably won't get into, but it's an interesting concept. Um, the ionosphere peaks at around 300 kilometers in the daytime, and we are flying about 500 kilometers. So we're, ICON flies above the ionospheric peak, but as you can see, we still get a good sample of plasma densities at those altitudes, and particularly important for us, plasma velocities. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And as you see, um, solar cycle, there's two colors on this line, just bring them up. The temperature changes drastically and densities change drastically with solar cycle. <clears throat> That's due to the fact that solar extreme ultraviolet output for changes by more than a factor of 10 from solar minimum to solar maximum. It's very, so the upper atmosphere is very sensitive to that. Um, because it's 10 million times less dense than the troposphere, it can be caused a glow. That is, you know, you make a neon light by evacuating most of the gas out of the tube. So you can accelerate charged particles, electrons, uh, up to a velocity that they can actually gain enough speed to have the energy to excite uh, a molecule or, or a, a, an atom of a noble gas. Same thing in space, but now, you know, you can cause the atmosphere to glow. There's two ways to do that. You, uh, you're illuminated with the sun, and uh, of course it's illuminated and it's bright, but you get additional emissions because you're knocking electrons off of atoms and uh, molecules in, in of the thermosphere, creating ions and a very energetic electron population that can spray around and crash into things and cause it to glow. Again, it's more like a neon light. Um, the other thing that can happen is that after you've created all this I these ions and all this plasma, then you turn off the sun, say go to nighttime, you still have a lot of uh, atoms and molecules and ions in excited states and a lot of plasma that continued to glow and to radiate all night in the absence of the sun. So more of a photochemical processes. And there's two things. Um, you can produce red and green line both ways, but in, I'm gonna show you an image of red and green line at night. And you can see what I'm talking about. And there's also ultraviolet and extreme ultraviolet and these are, 
not super important, the difference between the two. But extreme ultraviolet is now coming from ions and ultraviolet oxygen is coming from atomic oxygen. And these are all targets for the mission. Uh, this plot here on the right shows sort of where those emissions are coming from, 300 down to all the way down to 100 kilometers. Here's the image that I want to show. Um, it's from an orbit of the space station, which is shown here. Uh, this trace, this green trace shows where the space station is about to fly. I'm going to show you the movie. Um, and so it's going to fly over the Caspian Sea, over Iran-Pakistan border, to, over India and south of India. So you'll see the things on the ground, but you'll see, so you'll see things in space. So here we are, there's the Caspian Sea, they're flaring gas over the Caspian Sea. And what do you see? There's two things. Well, okay, this is remarkable. There's a giant red glow in the sky. Um, the other thing you can see is a green glow that's not varying as much as that red glow. Where'd the red glow go? I don't know, but the green glow is still there. So that green glow is something you can you can use your ruler and tell you that's at 98 kilometers. In fact, I tried to tell, I was telling an astronaut about this image. And I said, yeah, this green glow is at 100 kilometers. He says, no, it's at 98. So I said, yes, sir. Uh, that gl green glow is right. It's the same green that we use as science target in the daytime. And at nighttime, that's a science target for us. We measure the Doppler shift of that so we can see how fast the gas is moving at that altitude. And we do the same thing with that red glow. That red glow is a science target for ICON. And we look at the Doppler shifts and I'll talk about that some, but where you see that glow and even where you can't see it, we're getting uh, uh, velocities of the, of the uh, neutral gas at those altitudes. What else to say? The red comes and goes. Why is it showing up and going away? And I'll show you a, sort of a big picture in a second uh, why that uh, does that. Um, if I, my screen moves forward. So, Here's a different picture um, from a higher altitude satellite. So the space station obviously is in Earth orbit. You can go higher Earth orbit, say an 18 hour orbit or something like this. This is what this research satellite had back in 2002. Take a picture, some pictures of the planet, send them down and process them. And you can see what you just flew through. There's two bands of bright UV light now, which correspond to those two red bands you saw in that movie. So the point is that the ionosphere has a structure and the simple plot of the ionosphere with altitude is fine, but there's more going on. And so that's what I'm trying to convey with this image. Um, this was a, uh, and I think that's about it. Uh, but this, this wavelength of light in the far ultraviolet is very handy because the nighttime is just about as bright as the daytime. So that's not a whole lot. Uh, that's obviously not the case in visible light. You can't see the aurora in the daytime but you can see it in the daytime if you're looking in the ultraviolet. Um, this picture shows that it's organized by the magnetic field. So that green line, you may not know this, but the Earth's magnetic field has this very interesting structure. And it's tipped, the, the Earth's magnetic field is tipped forward and it's not just a simple dipole, there's uh, more components to the field. And what it, gold is showing from a, its view from geosynchronous orbit, is that the ionosphere changes every day. Um, we knew that, but they were getting a fantastic new view of it. They're looking over, they're parked over Brazil, and every night they take images of the ionosphere and they see, you know, every night there's a completely different signature. Sometimes the bands are very well separated or extremely well separated, and sometimes they just collapse. So what's going on? Um, we want to understand and be able to predict that kind of thing. Um, and so we built ICON to go do the, exactly that. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but to understand what we've got to measure, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the physics of the ionosphere. So, and why you have two bands like that. So the sun, ion, sun does two things. It creates plasma. It ionizes the, the upper atmosphere in the daytime. It produces a big peak in plasma density. And it also, all that, that, all that creation of plasma also produces a lot of heat. So it heats up the daytime thermosphere. And when you heat something and you heat it here and it's cold over there, you get wind. And so those winds tend to start moving and pushing the plasma. And what the plasma wants to do is not what the wind wants to do. It wants to, it's listening to the magnetic field as well. Just like current flows through a copper wire, plasma wants to move along the magnetic field, not perpendicular to it. So it moves up. Um, 
So horizontal wind can lift the plasma. And um, when you lift the plasma up in a dipole field and then you sort of, it kind of give up, you run out of wind, you know, as the thermosphere is, the densities are dropping, you stuffed it up there and it says, well, thanks a lot. But now it's, now it's controlled by the magnetic field. And it, what it wants to do is follow that. So it goes down, flows down either way, north, south, around the Earth's magnetic equator and into these two regions that I've highlighted. And in fact, what actually happens is quite, is, is a pretty complex where this is a composite picture of nighttime images from a spacecraft that NASA flew in 20, 2002 and uh, shows that there's piles of plasma here and complete voids of plasma there. And this is part of the understand, we wanna gain a better understanding of these processes that cause plasma to be distributed unevenly around the planet and change all the time. Here's another picture of it changing all the time. Here's three days, three days straight. Middle of this picture is 2011 at Christmas, day before Christmas, day after Christmas, the ionosphere at the same exact time, or pretty much the same, I, I fudged these like a half hour, um, has very different densities. And now we're not, now we're using, building a picture just from measuring the plasma by looking at all the GPS satellites overhead and putting stations all around on the ground. And with, with, with GPS measure, measure a GPS signal gives you a sense of, gives you a measurement of the plasma density along that GPS, the, the line of sight to the GPS satellite. So there's no solar activity, there's no geomagnetic activity, and the plasma is changing constantly. So something else is going on. And uh, this movie kind of gives you a sense of maybe what could be going on. So I took this from a few years ago from a high altitude observatory, a National Center for Atmospheric Research. They have a complete model now of the lower atmosphere, and this is showing lower atmospheric um, uh, velocities, north-south velocity of the wind at 10 kilometers. And so there's your picture. This sort of looks like you know, weather systems moving around the planet. What the, the point was with this is that in the center of this image in the Pacific, there are several typhoons. And so what they wanted to do was see, well, do typhoons show up in space? Well, let's see. Let's use our model that gives us um, uh, the same picture at 100 kilometers. And OK, you can see there's a lot going on up in uh, space or right at the boundary of space. And in particular, there's these waves emanating out from the region of the typhoon in the Pacific. And there's also, if you squint and you can lose track of the wave, there's large scale variations moving all around the planet. There's big blobs of southward wind moving and northward wind moving. That's where it's turning black or white. So those kind of indications tell you that, man, the troposphere is definitely going to have an effect in space. So, and if I can get past this, other things that have effects in space, I don't think this is, I don't think it's too soon. I think this is, uh, hope, hopefully you understand why I think twice about showing this because it's sort of harsh. Um, but there's other things that can cause waves in space, like a giant earthquake. So a big star is going to show up on Tohoku or else off the coast. And then you can see variations in total electron content overhead because they were in sunlight. Everyone remembers the movies because it was the middle, it was morning. And um, you're immediately those waves hit the ionosphere and start uh, modulating the production and loss of plasma. So um, this is again through GPS. Thousands of ground-based GPS stations can give you the data to, to make a picture of the plasma overhead. So there's a lot of indications we have to say, you should be looking at the boundary of space for, to predict what's going to go on at higher altitudes. So we built ICON, okay, I'm at 20 minutes, um, to measure a few things. We wanna measure the neutral wind that's driving the dynamo. We think it's gonna be pushing plasma around and causing that plasma to move in different directions. We wanna measure the composition of the atmosphere because this is the chemical background. This is the atmosphere is where the ionosphere comes from. And if it's changing in composition, like uh, the diff changes in diffusion um, and you have more nitrogen or oxygen, you can control the loss and production of plasma. Uh, temperature also, those waves that you see in the movie that I showed are gonna have temperature signatures where you have convergence and divergence of, of gas. So you have basically compression and that where the gas is converging, you're gonna have temperatures increase and, and the opposite where there's divergence. 
Uh, we measure the, and we want to motion, measure the motion of the plasma and the whole plasma density profile. So that's what we built. I'm not going to get to talk about all of our results. I'm going to talk about mainly the neutral winds and the plasma motion together. I'll get to that. But here I'm going to talk about instruments, if you don't mind. Um, it was, we built, we flew four instruments. Uh, and I'm going to start with the simplest one first. So this is a spectrographic imager. And what that means is that, what this one means is that it, it's a 1D imager. So there's a slit in there and a grating. It's the simplest spectrograph with a, a slit spectrometer, but uh, it's a little different flavor on it. It's a toroidal grating. So we're focusing light, but we're imaging only in the vertical direction. The spectral direction, we have no imaging capability. Um, but we are able to spectra to produce sp vertical spectral profiles of what we see off on the horizon. Um, uh, let me, this is just the guts of the thing. Light comes in the entrance baffle, and it. Sorry, if I'm going to. My mouse is not big enough. To, no, it doesn't grow or anything. Um, but and it hits this optical element, which is a grating, and then it sends that reflected light focused in. Uh, altitude, and uh, with the, uh, the light then separated across the detector. <clears throat> and so you're imaging the slit onto the detector at a bunch of different wavelengths. Um, here's the team. I, I guess uh, the mask joke, <laughs> uh, what's the mask joke? It's uh, uh, there were anti-maskers before they were anti-maskers. So, uh, some of these guys decided that in the clean room, they should have their mask off, which, I, which shocked me then. It even shocks me more now. Um, that's all. And there's the instrument they built. So um, <clears throat> uh, there it is, just to, just to prove we built it. Um, this is what you get when you point it into space away from the Earth down into deep space. Um, that's a helium line. That's a neutral helium. That's interstellar helium. I understand there's an interstellar galactic source for this helium. It's illuminated by the sun. So there's a HE uh, helium 83584 line, extreme, extreme ultraviolet. That's uh, obviously illuminating the whole local environment. <clears throat> um, and this is what you see. Uh, it's uniform because across up and down the slit, we're not, we have, it's 15 degrees and we don't see much change. This is what you get when you look at the moon. You get that interstellar helium, but you get some other stuff and you, what you get off the moon is the solar spectrum, uh, which is interesting, uh, which is our calibration source. So what do you mean a calibration source? Well, we go ask S Solar Dynamics Observatory, the instrument on there called EVE, about uh, what, that, um, what the solar spectrum is. And we line our data right up on top of it from our lunar calibration. And lo and behold, we can identify several several important lines. Um, we, an oxygen line is important for us, and the, there's some others. Um, and of course, the sun, like I said, it illuminates um, the whole local environment. But if you look directly at the sun, you just get this much 584. But, and you fill your whole field of view with it by looking out in the uh, interstellar, interplanetary uh, environment, you get a much brighter line. And this is looking at the Earth. <clears throat> it's like a flag for the Earth. Um, you have Helium as well, uh, neutral helium. We have a lot of helium in our upper atmosphere. Uh, then this is an oxygen line, this first red one. And over here is the big oxygen line, which we've been looking for, which is completely lacking in the interstellar source. There's not a lot of neutral oxygen flying around, at least not in the galaxy. OK, um, moving up. This is a spectrographic imager, but it's a 2D spectrographic imager. This is the FUV imager that we're going to use to do two things measure one wavelength and another wavelength. And those wavelengths correspond to an, a neutral oxygen, atomic oxygen in this atomic nomenclature. Atomic oxygen is OI and then uh, N2. So there's a band emission of N2, lots of different bands and we pick a bright part that works for us. The concept of it is straightforward. The implementation is horribly complex, um, but the concept is you have an aperture on an instrument with a 15 by 15 square degree field of view. Actually, we open that up. We have an even larger field of view, but and you focus that light on a, on a, with a first lens 
onto uh, onto a uh, inner to perform an intermediate image on a, in a second lens. But in the way you put a transmission grating, so now you're separating light just like we did with the EUV. You're separating the light in FUV wavelengths now, <clears throat> and so light is going to start is going to be spread of uh, left to right and or top to bottom in this imager, and then you put two exit apertures, the same exact size as your entrance aperture, which is which are the size of the tab key on your keyboard. If you look down, that's how big the aperture is, and <clears throat> then you have two focusing uh, lenses in back that focus the light at two different wavelengths now, because you separate it out in wavelength by by picking the where the, where your exit apertures are to form two images on two different detectors. So we did that, except all reflective optics, which I think you, uh, some of us are much more familiar with actually. So this is the, um, this is the first lens, the collimating lens, which puts all the light onto, if you can see my mouse, onto the grating, where after all that light is now starting to separate in wavelength, and we captured all in the biggest mirror that we had on the whole uh, assembly, which is shown on the right, you can see the M2 mirror, which focuses the light back onto the back slits at two wavelengths. That's how it works. Um, we focused it in visible light first using a factor of three. To, uh, it was complicated, but we managed to do it at first in visible light and then um, got it over to uh, ultraviolet. Do I have first light? I have first light. So <clears throat> I didn't need to put Orion on here. You guys know what Orion is. But um, the point is that, wow, what a great image of Orion. Like, that's a very nice, clean picture of Orion, at least now on the left, obviously. So one of the sides of the, um, there's an extra reflection on one side versus the other. So the raw images have one of them's flipped. The left one is flipped, but that's the oxygen imager. And they're also distorted. So this is pre-distortion correction. There's optical distortions that we deal with in the, in the ground software generally. Um, <clears throat> but you can see Orion. I think Betelgeuse is missing, not because it doesn't emit UV light, which I don't think it does, but uh, I think it's off the grating. So the, the, I think actually this is a whole detector and the, the actual the image of the grating that is, is what shows up in the image is not, um, does not contain Betelgeuse, in case you're wondering. OK, so now we're going to go to interferometry. Interferometry is spectrometry's tricky cousin. And what you do with an interferometer is cause you spectrally separate light, and you cause it to interfere with itself. In fact, it's, we don't it doesn't spectrally separate light. It does, it does this to all the light. It causes all the light to come in and interfere with itself. In fact, if you just let all the light in and all the light out, you wouldn't see anything. It's like, oh, this is neat. So what you want to do is filter it specifically for what the light you want to be interfering with itself. And then, and then once you've done that, you can send all the light in and have all the light come out, but you have to filter it with a very narrow band filter on the, on the output. So it's actually quite different from spectrometry. Sorry. Uh, that was incorrect of me to say. But we're looking at these emissions again, 55, 77, 6300. And now we're looking at A band, which is a bright infrared emission that some of you may have run into. <clears throat> how does it work? This is how it works. So let me let me talk to the instrument a little bit. There's a big baffle on there, bigger than all the other instruments, because we're operating in daytime in the visible, invisible light regime. And the earth is very bright compared to these emissions. And we want to do the science in the daytime and with this extremely bright source right below you. A, a couple degrees below you on the horizon. So the baffle is important. Um, the CCD camera is the end of the whole thing. Uh, there's a lot of different optical elements in here, including different shutters. And there's an interferometer. I talk about this whole instrument as an interferometer, and this is a beam splitter. But the real instrument people say, this is the interferometer. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about the interferometer. Uh, this is it in a cartoon form. Um, you see, I just, it's, so light comes in uh, uh, well, this point here, the beam splitter. Sorry, no, light comes in here on this side. 
and it's split to go down the two arms and come back and reflect back off the beam splitter and come back out on the right hand side. Um, the arms are different lengths. If you compare this, this uh, portion to this portion, there's quite different. Uh, the spacers are, are mm, inert and the, 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 the elements on these, these two things are different sizes. So if you step back and think about a Michelson, if anyone's done the experiment, it's just two mirrors and a beam splitter. And you change the, the length of one of the arms with the change in the mirror, and you can produce an airy pattern. I did this in college, uh, which has circular rings in, on, on the output. If you take a laser and put it in and you do this, you can cause that laser light to interfere with itself and you end up with this cool pattern. Um, it's not unrelated to this pattern that you get out of this interferometer. <clears throat> so you get this crazy pattern that grows towards the middle and, and, and it uh, fades out. But the, the frequency of that, of that uh, interference is, a, is the same across the interferometer. Um, so the, the interesting point about this is that what we're trying to get after is not really this, the, the frequency itself. We know the we want to know the frequency of the light that we've gotten to, but here at about zero path difference where the light is frequently interfered with itself for the first time, um, uh, that never, there's no Doppler shift to that. So the Doppler shift is going to be the widening of this pattern. That envelope is going to change slightly. And so um, um, we don't care about this whole pattern. We want part of this pattern. So we reduce the interferometer to a portion of the interferometer. And so you reduce it to light that would be coming through the beam splitter, one portion of it going through a wide, a wide field widening prism on one side and the narrow part of it on the other side and coming back and interfering with itself again. And looking at these fringes out here, because these are the ones that are gonna be marching across the seam, uh, not the ones in the middle as you change the wavelength of light. That's the simple explanation. There's the instrument, sorry, I'm, I'm being sort of flipped. There's two of them um, with a large cooler. That, that, what you, that white fin on the top is a radiator. That ra yes, oh, there's, someone was allowed to unmute. There we go. Um, the radiators keep the CCDs down at minus 40. 10 years ago, they would have been minus 80 to get the noise performance we're getting on these CCDs now. So um, luckily we're able to, so a number of things came together to make this mission work. Um, and this is first light. So this is what you get when you look off on the limb of the earth. Um, the blue, the green line was confined to that sharp line that you saw from the space station. But in daytime, it grows, it's a much larger range of altitudes. We get winds all the way up to 200 kilometers from, and what you're not seeing is those fringes moving with the wind. They're moving and you can, once you fit these things, you can get uh, the fringes down to much smaller than a pixel, the motion of the fringes overall. So it's a fun feature of the instrument that it works and that the, we really are able to retrieve winds and I'll show some. Uh, temperatures too, they come down from these channels down here on the right. I guess I don't have time to talk about them, um, but that's a basic photometric retrieval. That just depends on uh, the, just looking at the emissions of the band. It's a rotational temperature retrieval, looking at the band emission. Okay. Oh, and one last instrument. And this is the keystone of the whole mission. This is the IBM. It measures plasma coming into the, the, the aperture that we ram. We push this into the plasma. We ram it into the plasma constantly. That's pointed in the direction of our motion and it measures the motion of the plasma and the temperature of the plasma. That's its job with a retarding potential analyzer and an ion drift meter. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about those conceptually, but I'm gonna try to be quick, but you can see that the three fields of view of the instrument are all pointing off to the north and they're all sometimes magnetically connected to what we're seeing at the spacecraft in the velocities. And that's important because the reasons I started to talk about the magnetic field, what's going on along that magnetic field, everything's sort of connected uh, electrically and the way that, so motion of the plasma along at the space, spacecraft is 
clearly well correlated with motion of the plasma everywhere else along that field line, because it has to be, uh, unless you're violating, uh, unless it, it becomes, unless you have field line resistance, which you don't, you have a infinite, highly conductive field line. Um, I guess I'll skip this a little bit, but to, believe me, we're measuring the motion of the plasma pretty well. So these are our fields of view again, and our original image I showed uh, in the daytime, MITEI's measuring everything from 90 to 300 kilometers, getting wind throughout. And the EUV and FUV, we're measuring from 100 to 500. Um, and then there's a little gap in nighttime. This gap comes from the fact that uh, there's not any light coming from those altitudes between 100 and 200 at nighttime. But still, we get winds in important regions. I'm going fast. I'm almost done. Have I? Uh, I don't know if I want to stop and take any questions about the instruments right now, or because I can keep going. Um, there aren't any yet in the chat, so if you want to keep going. Okay. Okay. Well, maybe I'll uh, take my time. So. So the question is, what's the effect of the neutral wind on the plasma velocities? <clears throat> Can you predict the plasma velocity from measuring the neutral wind? My argument was that we're measuring everything. You should be able to predict, if you understand the physics of the region, you should be able to make a prediction of the motion of the plasma on that field line by measuring things along that field line. <clears throat> so, um, so we've got the wind measurements now. We have to make some assumptions about the conductivities because uh, the conductivities uh, the neutral density can is go the neutral density of the atmosphere increases as the plasma density decreases but that still needs to be included in a conductivity calculation um, so that's one of our assumptions we're having to work with. we haven't used models for the conductivity but we have the um, uh, 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 the measurements of the wind and the north south east west components um, here uh, I want to show you this. Um, here's a picture of the winds uh, that we're measuring. So this is a single orbit of data from ICON. And <clears throat> um, yeah, I guess I'm not going to, I'm going to use all my time. So uh, what I'm showing here is the zonal wind that's east-west. Let's just look up here on the left-hand side. The east-west wind is from a, a wind model is this nice smooth thing. And this is at local, in the daytime. So local noon is 12. And sunrise is six and sunset's 18. So there you are. And all these winds are uh, zonally negative. That means they're westward. Um, westward winds in the daytime. Uh, surprised by that. Um, but in any case, um, uh, that's what we see in the uh, by in Mighty. Um, but we see a lot of differences as well. Look what's going on here at six in the morning who decided that the wind was going to take off and go completely strongly westward uh, right before the sun rose. And what effects does that have on the plasma environment? I don't know, um, but we've got more data to go with that. And then at nighttime, it certainly gets much more positive uh, than the, the model. So you get, so realize also, I mean, sit back for a minute. These winds are moving 150 meters per second. That's more than you and I are experiencing here on the ground. It's very thin, obviously, but you can really get the upper atmosphere moving, so you can put, you can carry a lot of energy, even though it's very thin. Uh, the meridional wind is uh, blue is northward, and red is southward. Um, this is the red line. This comes from the red emission that you saw from the space station. It's the same target, and we're using that to retrieve uh, meridional winds. Uh, the green line gets you down to lower altitudes. And like you saw in the space station images at nighttime from like midnight to six in the morning, which is this very narrow line that's only about a, up to about 110 kilometers altitude. But in the daytime, it goes all the way up to 200. We're retrieving winds. And man, if we aren't retrieving some really, really strong wind shears, um, the bigger than we ever thought, of course. Of course, we were going to be surprised by something, but these are big north-south wind shears. Um, that are going to have effects, electrodynamic effects, and they're not reflected in the model. Well, the model tries. It shows a shear, but it's plus or minus, you know, 40 versus this is plus or minus 100. So um, 
pretty neat to see these things are actually occurring in the upper atmosphere. And if I could spend more time on this, you see they change every orbit, change all the time. And um, we're looking at you, troposphere, stratosphere, for an answer to, to this because there's no specific reason that there's not a lot of, it's not a lot of turbulent behavior at these altitudes. Like I said, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, diffusion related. So you need to be pushing pretty hard to make these changes. Um, and we think it comes from the troposphere. Um, so here again is a picture from space, uh, a picture of our geometry of when we're on these field lines, where those field lines map down to. Sometimes they map down to the wind measurements that we made at, made at the same exact time, uh, which is what we want to do. And so here's the math page. Uh, Ohm's law is the, one of the first things you uh, learn in electrodynamics. And next thing you learn is Ampere's law, that, uh, which is Ohm's law just tells you that for, for a current, let me start, a current is equal to the conductivity times the electric field. If you stop there, that's pretty straightforward. You have a, you have a conductor and you could put a, if you increase the electric field in it, you get more current. Right, so I could stop there. Then there's U cross B, which is the neutral wind crossed with the B field times the conductivity, and it becomes sort of nuts. Whereas this time, again, a cross product gives you, you push it this way and it goes that way. So I'll stop, but that's the point of that, that we're working with straightforward equations for starters. And the fact that we're not gonna pile up charge anywhere, that, you, that current going in equals current coming out. We're not gonna, you can't build up charge uh, easily uh, anywhere, uh, and specifically not in space. So um, <clears throat> there's some other assumptions. Uh, so we can uh, calculate uh, what the current ought to be, the current that we're driving and solving for the current and going through a lot of uh, um, uh, about 20 lines of math, you can get to a velocity, which is the, perpendicular velocity, the upward velocity you should see at the spacecraft based upon the winds that you're seeing along the field line. So we go down and measure the field lines and we, and we multi convolve it with the modeled conductivity. And this is our prediction. Then we have a measurement of V2, which if I go back, V2 is in this format downward. This is the key thing. If, you're, if you create plasma and you, then you push it down into the atmosphere, it's gonna go away. If you create plasma and you lift it up out of the atmosphere, it might last a while. So that's the V predicting V2 from the winds is, is likely to give you a prediction of the density of plasma you're going to have or produce. So we minimum we our orbit is constantly going around the planet, precessing is complicated. We're not always at noon. And sometimes when we are at noon, we're off the equator. But when we're at noon and at the equator and all the way out to two, two in the afternoon, we take data. We collect those data. We make these calculations from the winds and we make a prediction of the velocities. And lo and behold, when the, when the, and, and I'm multiplying one of them by minus one so you can see it. When we have a predicted velocity in one direction, we get measured velocity in the other direction. And it switches and takes turns. So, and it happens in this one case. And so a month later, we're in this position, it happens again, where the predicted velocity and the measured velocity are kind of in sync. Um, this just shows all ar around the planet. This just shows all the data at one time. So regardless of longitude, just put, put, your, predict put your prediction down and I'll put the measurement down and then we'll see how those data fit to a line. And it's not bad. Um, so, but that's a cool result. That's what we were trying to go measure. So that's what we did. Now, and that has uh, never been done before. And some of us thought it would be zero and some of us thought it'd be 100%. Well, none of us thought it'd really be 100% because we knew we were missing something. We were missing when we we're looking north all the time, what's going on behind us. And, um, I'm going to stop the movie for a second. It's kind of distracting. Um, so what we what we figured out with Icon is just with two with two instruments, we was like, wow, what if we had four instruments so we could see the other side? Well, we don't need four instruments all the time. We need 
two instruments all the time. And we can pretend we have four instruments if we start moving things around. So at the equator, when making these crossings, we want to get winds at the, you know, I'm showing some uh, a, a place on the planet. Here's a longitude versus latitude plot near the equator. And you see the little fields of view of, of mighty pointed out there. And you see in the middle here, they're pointed, they're pointed, um, the pointed north in the middle, which is our nominal or, uh, pointing, as you see up in the right hand picture. That's how we usually fly. But before we get to that crossing, before we cross the equator, we do something else. We rotate the spacecraft and we get winds to the north and the south. Now we actually have measurements of having done that. Um, this was our plan. And you can see, if I don't, I'm trying not to stop the movie, that the east-west wind at the north wind foot point is completely different than the south foot point. So no wonder that we're only getting get about or cor correlation of 0.5 if you're just looking up north because the south foot point's deriving the same physics as the, of what's going on at the north foot point. And you got to consider those two things in, in competition, particularly the zonal wind, which turns out to be the more important component. The east-west wind is going to be driving that plasma up and down uh, specifically. So now I think I'm done. Yeah, so what's What's kind of surprising is we're almost at the end of our two-year mission, which went really fast. Um, we had a long uh, flight delay getting on orbit, and it's fine. Um, we got our data that we wanted. Um, the effective winds on the ionosphere was the top goal of the mission, capturing that, and give, and we have lots more data to look at. All those con we have a, something like 500 conjugate maneuvers. We have now two years of data crossing the equator uh, through all these different seasons all four seasons. So um, uh, we have more to go, but right now we're impressed with nature geoscience, which I'm excited about. And these are the last figures that I showed you were from that new the article that's in press. Um, there's more to do with atmospheric waves and tides. The waves you saw in the movie from, from the model from, from the National Center for Atmospheric Research, um, those uh, specifically are a target for us and we've got just scads of data on atmospheric tides we're fitting the atmospheric the neutral winds along with the neutral temperatures which are related to to produce a higher level products they can go into their models and inform them of the tidal char the character of the tides the atmospheric tides uh, which are, are really going to be <clears throat> driving larger scale effects um, so that's been fun to work with all the scientists on that and that's coming together well. And of course, your magnetic storm effects tell you the uh, the wind, the effects of a small magnetic storm on the winds around the planet that we've seen with Mighty is uh, just out of this world. And it's exciting to see it. I'm sure I don't have more time to show that. Um, but that's something that we're going to be showing at American Geophysical Union this, this uh, winter and uh, working more to get more in publication about those effects. Um, so I hope I gave you a sense of what we're doing with, with ICON, how it might sort of be as important or interesting to astronomers, and, uh, and uh, what we may be able to do in the future. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Immel. That was really um, interesting and detailed and thorough. And I was jotting some questions down. And it's funny, you answered a lot of them as, okay. <laughs> as we went along. Um, <laughs> But we do have a couple questions, and um, Chris actually has the same question I did. What have been a few of the biggest surprises with ICON? Um, I know you said it's, uh, I guess it's been about two years of data now. Any um, major things that you weren't expecting or predicting? Um, well, we certainly don't predict, we never predicted to have such large discrepancies in the winds uh, at different foot points from the north and south. And this goes specifically to, we're seeing isolated regions of extremely large shears that aren't related to anything else going on the day side. It sounds like, it sounds a little hokey, but we're studying this now. We're spending times on weekly calls now talking about what's going on with these wind shears. Um, down here at 100 to 150 kilometers 
about 130, where you're just going to be influencing the dynamo as well. <clears throat> you get these phantom shears that are seen uh, over about a thousand kilometers of space that come out of nowhere. And I don't know what those are. Um, <laughs> there's a zoo of waves that you might attribute them to, but um, that they show up, so that they sort of pop up like these rogue waves or like, I don't know, I would say I'll stick with rogue waves, um, but they're quite frequent and um, we see them every day. So that's a surprising result that th this sort of, this picture sort of reflects that kind of thing, that this may be one of those times where we had a really strong shear or that these isolated shears, like you can see how quickly this velocity is changing from 150 to 130, it's changing by 100 meters per second. Um, those are, that's going to have an electrodynamic effect, and um, these are the this is the kind of thing that you, you might expect if if you had an isolated shear zone pop up out of nowhere on your magnetic field line. So that's I think that's probably the that's the biggest. I mean, I, I guess I forgot all the surprises. Um, but that's the current surprise is these uh, these sort of rogue waves in the thermosphere. Is there a plan to do this again in a decade or two from now? Do you think that um, that would the data would be a lot different? So I guess there's uh, there's two answers to that. One is Icon is we're going to propose to continue our mission, and there's things we could do to sort of continue to collect data in this regard, uh, probably looking at uh, making sure we're getting a complete global sampling. So turn the whole spacecraft around and look south for periods of time to see if, you know, if there's anything having to do with the distribution. There's a lot more land mass in the Northern Hemisphere. So um, it could be related to troposphere. If it's related to events in the troposphere, then we might operate differently. Um, NASA in the future is expecting to fly a mission called Dynamic, which right now they're they're just in the early stages of planning for, and they want to make it a smaller mission than I thought they were going to. But this is clearly a topic that they would want to be able to address. Um, of course, this also has to go to the modelers too. Is can you can anyone explain um, uh, in any in any way the appearance of these these uh, phantom shears? Uh, but it, dynamic may be built for that kind of thing. Also, dynamic also, you know, having, you know, I, I tell everyone who asks, you know, what is this a good orbit? No, all orbits are terrible. You're in one place at one time. You can't see anything else on the planet, no matter what. And so um, I would fly more satellites, um, smaller, you know, you can, you can miniaturize. We miniaturize a lot to get to ICON. Um, but we that continues this this advantages coming from commercial miniaturization of avionics and so forth. You could fly two or three satellites with some subset of icons capability, probably for about the same amount of money. And then that would give you a better sense of a lot of things like the distribution of the shears and also really characterize uh, the middle you know medium scale uh, variability. Okay. So, Great, thank you. Um, let's see, a couple other questions popped up. Uh, you showed that tropospheric weather has an impact on the plasma field. Is the opposite true as well? Can these plasma winds and densities have an impact on terrestrial weather? I, I think the answer is um, not that I know of. Um, the things that the relations we see continuously are that the troposphere and stratosphere can really force a lot of uh, changes in the upper atmosphere. Um, the, 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 things, the thing to think about in the upper atmosphere is during geomagnetic storm, you're producing a lot of NO, and a lot of NOx in uh, the auroral region, and this can um, filter down to actually have effects in the stratosphere. So um, I think, so the HAO, the National Center for Atmospheric Research has long <clears throat> looked at this. Um, this was a focus for the uh, an earlier NASA mission called TIMED, 
where they were tracking some of the largest magnetic storms of the last solar cycle, say Halloween of 2023, sorry, 2003. Um, there is this uh, large enhancement of nitric oxide that uh, settled down into the polar regions and into the polar vortex. Um, and it came from the aurora. So that was pretty neat. Um, that's an example of that kind of thing. Uh, but it's not related to sort of day-to-day -day variations. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Oh, one person asked, I see that data is available online. How often is that updated? Well, that's good. It, so that's a good question. It varies. So first of all, it's on an FTP site, um, which is linked from our uh, website. Um, we are, uh, so I'll just tell you how it works. We process the data. Um, we um, so, sorry, that's the last thing that happens. <laughs> First thing is that we get the data from the spacecraft and we're arguing over um, basically at level one, you know, at the, at, so level zero is telemetry. Level one is calibrated radiances or whatever you measuring. Level two is the retrieved product like wind. So level one is Doppler shift and two is wind. And getting, getting the Doppler shift software right and making that work, getting a wind, um, when that's all lined up, it takes about two weeks to get the data online. But updates are always in the works. So an upda updates come, you know, we've been waiting for an update for the WINS product for um, since January. Okay. So the answer is two weeks or nine months, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Um, Dave asks, we ham radio types use the E and F layers in the in the ionosphere to make worldwide communications. Is this the plasma field that's refracting our signals? Yeah, uh, it is. Um, this, the, and I don't have a, a lot of good uh, ionospheric uh, imagery, um, but so, and I, I hate to talk about it because I, I sort of understand the, the uh, ionosphere, but I'm, I'm a little less on ham. But I know that sporadic E, so these shears actually can introduce, uh, can promote the uh, occurrence of high density regions in the E region. And times of sporadic E are, um, there's a sporadic E season in the Northern hemisphere. And I have a couple hams in our mission ops or ham radio operators. And um, um, <laughs> I was gonna say they're hams too. Um, <laughs> But the, um, the neat thing about that is that you can get, you can pick up radio signals or you send radio signals suddenly uh, at nighttime all around the planet. Now, I thought you could do that in the E region anyway, but sporadic E introduces, I think, some special cases for you know, making communications possible that weren't possible before. Um, what, what the, I think, I think the usual thing is predicting outages. And that would be like a big D region absorption where you suddenly have a ton of plasma at 80 kilometers where there's a lot of atmosphere and the thing's just like a, a sponge. Um, <clears throat> um, so yes, in any case, the E and F regions that we're studying are the same that go uh, are, are of interest to ham operators. Um, here's a picture of, you know, there's a there's ionosphere everywhere in this image. There's a super dense eye, so the, the, the brightness of this light is corresponds to the square of the electron density. So we have this sort of, we've, it's, the electron density actually is smoother. So you have to take the square root of this picture to get to your actual electron densities. Um, but it, it shows why equatorial communications or trans-equatorial communications can be much more interesting in, in radio than just uh, talking to Europe. Perfect. Um, Dr. Immel, do you have time for one more question? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, the last question is, do you have any speculations about what causes red sprites or blue jets? Well, no, but I've got a sprite. Let's see if we can find it. Where is it? Did we miss it? Yeah, we missed it. I'll back up. If everyone doesn't know, I've got one in this movie. Where is it? Oh gosh, it was right there. 
So there was a study of all these images from the space station and someone took all of them and looked for sprites. Oh, here it was, did you see it? There's a glow up here. I think this is it, there was a sprite. <clears throat> so sprites are these phantom uh, 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 appearances of really remarkable emissions. It's not a very good picture of one. I th maybe the compression of the movie is not so good, but. This is one of those cases where we they saw a sprite. Um, blue jets, I, no, I don't have a lot of speculation. I know that there's been a lot of study of those and they are due to electromagnetic discharges and the transfer of current and closure of current all the way up to the ionosphere. Um, you know, these were predicted, uh, these were predicted, uh, I think it was Rutherford who predicted them, um, just that the, you get a breakdown uh, that you could, uh, an electric field, a reasonably large electric field would accelerate charge to cause breakdown at you know, 50 kilometers or something. So um, uh, I don't have much speculation. I'm conf I'm, 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 I still don't understand why blue jets are so different and so strangely uh, out of family with red sp with sprites. If it was just sprites, then we'd be done explaining things. But the fact that blue jets show up and they're so different, um, is one of the more remarkable mysteries, I think, of, uh, for me, uh, not having studied it recently, about the whole uh, upper atmospheric lightning um, study. Well, thank you so much. Um, it will be interesting. Hopefully, your mission gets extended, and it'll be interesting to see what the next few months bring. And hopefully, you can talk with us again <laughs> um, for a future presentation. But um, thank you. It was really informative and okay. we really appreciate your time. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you everybody for showing up and, um, definitely be with us next time and hopefully see you all again soon. Bye.